can you please turn to Acts 2? Acts chapter 2. Beginning to read at verse 22, we're still in the day of Pentecost. And Peter is in the middle of his sermon, or rather we are in the middle of his. Verse 22 of Acts 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope. For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let thy holy one see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou wilt make me full of gladness with thy presence. <coughs> Brethren, I may say to you confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make thy enemies a stool for thy feet. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other words, and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all as any had need. And day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. I have recently read a book called The Longest Day, which has now been made into a film. And it's about that fateful day in June 1944 when the combined forces of the Allies invaded France. 
And the title comes from a remark of a German general that the invasion day would be the longest day of the war and that by the end of it the outcome of the war would be settled. And it's a fascinating book. The longest day in the history of the church over the last 2,000 years was the day of Pentecost. And by the end of that day, the ultimate outcome of the war between good and evil was known. Just as General Eisenhower knew that the war was going to be won by the Allies and General Rommel knew that the war was going to be lost by the Axis, by the end of the day of Pentecost, the apostles knew that the war was going to be won and that the devil was going to lose. Consider the numbers alone. By the end of that day, 120 had become 3,120, the longest day. And so much happened during that day that I haven't even been able to take it through Acts 2 in one service, even preaching as long as I do. It's the longest day. And indeed, I don't think the church has ever quite reached again the peak that we find in Acts 2. Whenever I want to know what the church of Jesus Christ ought to be like, I read Acts 2 again. And I realize there that we've got a pattern of church life and an ideal before us, which is not like the carrot in front of the donkey, an unattainable thing but which is the pattern held out for our emulation, for our prayer that we may seek to be like this. Now just let me recap what happened in the first part of the day. I only got about as far as 10 o'clock in the morning last Sunday evening. Three things happened which we looked at last Sunday. They had an experience, an unforgettable experience which filled them with God and opened their mouths, which was quite something with 120 ordinary men and women. The experience caused an excitement and the crowd came running together to hear what was going on. And then Peter gave an explanation and the explanation he gave was this. In Churchillian words almost he says, this is the beginning of the end. This is the sign that we have now entered the last period of history. The signs on earth which inaugurate this last period are that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh regarded regardless of sex, age or class. And the signs of the end of this period will be that even the sun and the moon change and disappear. And Peter is saying we are now living in the last days we have moved into the last period of history God has said his last word and therefore now we are living in the last opportunity for men to be saved and he got all this out of the Old Testament out of his Bible knowledge from the book of the prophet Joel and the last thing he quotes from the prophet Joel is this if you really are serious, if you realize that we're in the last period of history, then you will want to know how you can escape the end. You will want to know how you can escape the perishing that will come to the whole universe, the destruction that is on its way. Well, the answer is, in the same prophecy, Joel the prophet said hundreds of years before, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that's where we left the story last Sunday. But it leaves one question unanswered, and it's this. What is the name of the Lord upon which we are to call? What name are we to use to be saved? Now, there is a group well known to you who tell us that the name of the Lord is Jehovah, and that that is the name that you must use. But Peter didn't give that answer. Peter began to preach a sermon about another name, a name that was now the only name among all the names known on earth, the only name through which a man could know salvation, and it's the name of Jesus. And so Peter took up a prediction of centuries before 
probably seven or eight hundred years before. And he said, now the name referred to, which through the last period of history is the only name that can save anybody, is the name of Jesus. Now I don't know if you realize how common the name of Jesus was in those days. As you walk down the road, you would say, good morning, Jesus. How's the wife, Jesus? Children are all right, Jesus? Because you'd meet them all down the road. There are seven people of the name of Jesus in the New Testament alone. And so he had to begin by giving his address as well. Jesus of Nazareth. This is the name. Jesus of Nazareth. One of the most striking things of all about the preaching of the New Testament is that they did not preach Christmas. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Because when you said Jesus of Nazareth, or Thomas of so-and-so, or Judas of Kerioth, that's what Judas Iscariot means, you actually gave the place of their birth. Not where they lived, but the place of their birth. That's how they were known. On your birth certificate and on mine is my name, where I was born. Now, in exactly the same way, they used to say Jesus of so-and-so, and he should have said Jesus of Bethlehem. This is very striking indeed. As far as we can see, the apostles did not know the Christmas story when they preached the gospel. Why do I mention this? For precisely this reason that Christmas never saved anybody. It's interesting that the world perhaps thinks more about things that are in the Bible at Christmas than at any other time. Why is it that they don't get changed? Why is it that they don't get saved? Precisely because the gospel is not the Christmas story. You don't even need to know the Christmas story to be saved. What do you need to know about Jesus Christ? Well, you need to know these things. You need to know first that he lived. That he was a real man. That he was, in fact, a carpenter of Nazareth. You need to know that he traveled around and that one of the main things that he did was perform supernatural miracles for people. You need to know that things happened in his life that are only to be explained by saying that God was with this man. He healed the sick, he made blind people see, he made deaf people hear, lame people walk. He even raised the dead from their own coffins. He changed water into wine at a wedding reception where they'd run out. He stilled a storm at sea because people were in danger of drowning and were frightened. This is what you need to know, that this man went about doing things that only God can do. That's the first thing you need to know. And Peter says, this Jesus of Nazareth, God worked through him signs and wonders and miracles, and you know that he did this, you remember these things happening. Now, of course, we don't remember, we weren't there, but we need to know and believe these things. Secondly, you need to know that Jesus died on a cross. And you need to know that that tragic event at the age of 33 was no accident. It had been planned before the world began and that God had arranged it in every detail. You need to know this. You need to know that among all the crosses of history and among all the executions of criminals, there was one that God had planned for centuries before. And it was the cross of Jesus. You need to know that the Jews so worked things that they managed to get other people to do their dirty work for them. And they managed to get people outside their own law to put Jesus to death on something that was in their law and not in the Roman law. And Peter says, this Jesus who by the determined plan and foreknowledge of God was crucified, you killed through the hands of lawless men. The Jews got the Romans to put Jesus on the cross. But if we ask who, who decided that he should die like that, the answer is God. Now straight away we're up against one of the great mysteries of the Bible, which I'll mention now. I can't say anything about it, I can only mention it. 
But that one verse clearly says that there is no contradiction between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. There is no contradiction between God's free will and man's free will. Between God doing something and man doing something. Both are true. God was responsible for the cross and so were men. The cross was a divine and a human event. When God was doing something and man was doing something. Man was doing something evil. God was doing something good. And that's why Christians ever since have called it Good Friday. And not Bad Friday. Because they've seen what God was doing. Not what man was doing. If you ask the important question. Why did the Jews want Jesus dead? The answer is very simple. Because he said he was two things. Because he said he was Christ. Their savior, their messiah. The one they'd waited for for a thousand years. And because he said he was Lord, which means that he said he was God. And the Jews said, no man must say that he's God. That is blasphemy. He deserves to die. And it was on the charge of blasphemy that they managed to engineer his death. So you need to know that Jesus lived and that he did miracles that only God can do. You need to know that men put him on a cross and killed him because he said he was God. And that God planned that they should. You need to know thirdly that God reversed the human verdict by raising him from the dead three days later. And Peter says God raised him from the dead and we are personal witnesses. We met him. We spoke to him. We saw him. We touched him. And you need to know that God said you are wrong about this man. He is my son. You said he is too bad to live. I say he is too good to remain in the tomb. And at this point, Peter went back to his Bible. Peter was now a man of the Bible. He'd been a fisherman. He was more at home with nets when Jesus first met him. But here's a man who now knows his Bible. And Peter says there are things said in the book of Psalms by David which couldn't possibly be true of David because they haven't happened. And David was in fact predicting things that would happen in the future. And he now quotes Psalm 16 where David says that he, he says using the personal pronoun, you will not leave me in the grave. But in fact David had been in his grave for a thousand years. David in the psalm said, my flesh will not see corruption. Yet in fact there was very little if anything left of his body in the grave. And Peter says, David must have been talking about the son of David, the Christ. Now it's very interesting that the Jews said and still say that corruption of the body begins on the fourth day. Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. And his sister said, Jesus, there will be a smell by now because he's been four days in the tomb. And it was considered that the real corruption of the body only began on the fourth day. Therefore, David's prediction that God's Holy One would not see corruption demands that before the fourth day, someone be brought out of their tomb. And David says... Peter says, David said that a thousand years ago. He can't have been speaking of himself because his body is rotting in the tomb and you visit that tomb as a shrine every day. But Peter says, we know someone who was out of his tomb within three days. And his name is Jesus. And you need to know this if you're going to be saved. And the fourth thing that you need to know about Jesus of Nazareth, if you're going to be saved, is this. Where is he now? Now bear in mind that Peter said this within a couple of hundred yards of the tomb in which they'd buried Jesus. And one of the proofs of the truth of the resurrection is this. That he would not have dared to say this within two months of the event. When he knew perfectly well that all they would need to do to disprove it would be to go to the tomb and produce the corrupting remains of Jesus. No Jew could ever produce the dead body of Jesus, nor could any Roman. 
But now here's a, an interesting thought which you may never have thought, and it's this. The Jews and the Romans couldn't produce the dead body of Jesus, but the disciples couldn't produce the live body of Jesus. Did that ever strike you? The people could have said, well, we know the tomb's empty, but you produce the live body and we'll believe you. They could not do so. Why not? Because Jesus was no longer on earth. And the fourth part of the gospel is this, that Jesus, having lived on earth, performed miracles by God's power, having died on a cross by God's plan and man's evil action, having been raised from the dead the third day, went back to heaven and is there now, this very moment. We need to know this. Now Peter then proceeds to give proof of this fact of the ascension of Christ to his congregation. And this is how he proves it. They always believed that when the Christ came, the promise that God had made through Joel would come true. And that when the Christ came, God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And Peter says, it's happened and that proves to you. Not only that Jesus was the Christ, but that when he got back to heaven, the first thing he did was to take this promise from the Father and pour it out upon us and prove to you that in fact he was the Christ. The Spirit has come as proof. And he quotes another psalm here, Psalm 110, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. Once again, David sees a vision of somebody other than God whom he yet calls Lord, sitting at the right hand of God, and all his enemies down below his feet. And Peter says, here is David, the greatest king of Israel, second only to God in that sense. Only one above him, God, as king of King David, as king of Israel. Now says there's someone else up there, Someone else I call Lord. The Lord God said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Now who could David be talking about? Somebody else who is Lord of David. And the answer Peter gives is Jesus. Now we've come to the crunch of the sermon. The statement that sums it all up. Peter says, I want you men of Israel to know this. That the man you crucified, the man Jesus whom you crucified, this one man, God has made him Lord and Christ. The two things that they didn't believe, the two things that they said were not true, the two things that made people say crucify him, away with him, put him to death. This then is the statement that Peter uses to clinch the sermon. He says, you crucified him because he said he was Christ. And you said, no, he isn't. You crucified him because he said, I am the Lord God. And you said, no, he isn't. Now I tell you that God has proved to you that you are all wrong. That this was the greatest crime that has ever been committed. That this is not only the murder of an innocent man. You lifted your hands against God when you lifted your hands against this man. When you said crucify him, you were crying out against God's Lord and Christ. That is why when we talk of Jesus today, we don't talk of Jesus of Nazareth. We speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. If I were here tonight just to talk of a great human being a great teacher, a great man like Gandhi or somebody else, if I were just here to talk of Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth, there would be no gospel for you. He could do nothing for you today except hold out before you the kind of life you can never live. That's all I could do. And there are people outside the church of Christ who believe in Jesus as a great man as a wonderful character, as perhaps the greatest man who's ever lived. But they have no gospel, no good news. Peter says, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's great news. It means that Jesus is alive, that he's at the right hand of God where he is most used to me, and that he can do something for me. Such then is the sermon of an illiterate fisherman 
who'd hardly been to school and couldn't speak his own language properly and it's one of the finest sermons that has ever been preached. It is centered in the Bible. It is centered in Jesus Christ, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection and ascension, which are the gospel. And it is Trinitarian in that it speaks of the Father in heaven, Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit poured out. It's a marvelous sermon. Where did a fisherman get to preach like that? Where did he learn this? The answer is he'd been with Jesus. And an ignorant and an unlearned man can preach like this when he's been with Jesus. There's no teacher like Jesus. Now can you imagine someone coming to you and accusing you of murdering not just a great man but God's own son? And can you imagine what you would feel like if you realized that it was true? Something would go through you like a knife. You would be pricked in your heart. You'd say, what on earth can I do? There's nothing for me but the deepest hell if I've done that. Can you imagine how these people felt? Only seven weeks previously they'd shouted, crucify him, crucify him. They'd watched people spit on him. They'd made jokes about him and said, if you're the son of God, then save yourself. Jump off the cross if you really can perform miracles. And they'd laughed and they'd mocked. And they'd all stood there and watched him stark naked as he died. Can you imagine how they felt? Well, I think you might imagine it if you begin to realize that your sins crucified Jesus Christ. That those people who jeered and mocked and shouted crucify him were no worse than any of you. That the sins which made them do it, cowardice and envy and other things, are the sins that have been in your heart and mind. And therefore you were there when they crucified my Lord. And therefore I say this Jesus whom you crucified, whom your sins nailed to the tree, God has made him Lord and Christ. This is God's opinion of Jesus. This is God's verdict on the trial of Jesus Christ. The lower court said blasphemy away with him. But a higher court said he is Lord. Jesus Christ. And so we come to the exhortation of Peter. It seems a hopeless situation. A man who realizes he's guilty of murdering the Son of God might think that he had committed the unforgivable sin, but he hasn't. And I want to say to you tonight that if people who murdered Christ can be forgiven, then you can. If there is mercy for those who killed the Son of God, there is mercy for you. And a man who says, well, I could never be forgiven. I've done too many bad things. I'm beyond redemption. That man needs to read Acts 2 again, where the murderers of Christ were told how they could be saved. Even on the cross, as they gambled for his clothes at his feet, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And now Peter says, I'll tell you what you can do. It's a wonderful reply, full of hope, full of mercy. He says there's a complete answer to your crime. What do you need to do? He says there are two things you need to do. And if you do them, there are two things that God will do for you. What do you need to do? Repent and be baptized. That's all. Now, isn't that simple? He could have said, well, do ten years penance. And the way some people talk about Peter, you'd have thought that's what he would have said. But he didn't. He said, repent and be baptized. He could have said, well, come to church for ten years. But he didn't. He could have said, well, try and live a decent life from now on and try and put right what's wrong. But he didn't. He could have said, well, bring a lot of money for the work of the Lord, but he didn't. I can think of a hundred things that he might have said, but he only said two. Repent and be baptized. In other words, repent, turn right away from your past. Literally, the word repent in the Greek language means afterthought or think again. Think again about all that you've done. Disown it. Turn away from it. Turn your back on all that. Turn right around and come to Jesus Christ. 
and then express the desire to be utterly cleansed of this thing by having your whole body washed. Be washed from head to toe, get it all cleaned up. Come to God and say, God, I want to be clean of this. That's what baptism at first expresses. It means much more than that. It means a burial of all your sins. It means being identified with Christ. It means lining yourself up with Jesus because you're baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. It means so much. I do not believe that baptism is an optional extra for any Christian. Peter said on the first day of Pentecost, and I don't think the message has changed one bit, repent and be baptized, every one of you. This is the normal, indeed it is the commanded way to repent. It is the command of Jesus that this is how we express our coming to him. Now I'm going to be very direct here. There are baptismal classes starting tomorrow night at 7 in this church. Some of you have not been baptized. Repent and be baptized. That is the way that Jesus commanded before he left them. It's the way that Peter preached. It's a simple thing. It's over quickly. It's just a simple step. And yet still people hesitate to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Why? This is the ordained way to come. He didn't say sign a decision card, come to the front. He said repent and be baptized. This is the way that Christ chose. And if he could go all the way to the cross for us, can we not go to the baptistry for him? This was the way for them and it has been the way ever since. That's all that we're asked to do. Now, Peter might have said, well, believe in the Lord Jesus, but they wouldn't have asked the question if they didn't believe already. Faith alone is not the full response. The full response in the Bible to the gospel is threefold. Repent, believe, and be baptized. And that response is how we are to accept the gospel of Jesus. It is the total response of a simple believer. Now, he knew they believed because... They said, what shall we do? And a man doesn't say that unless he believes in Jesus. Then repent and be baptized. Complete your response. Let there be an act of the will. You've understood with your mind and you believe that Jesus is Lord and Christ. You've responded with your heart. You're pricked in your heart. You're therefore ready for the next two steps of the will. Repent, turn away, be baptized and be washed. And then, says Peter, God will do two things for you. He'll forgive your sins. May I again quote P.T. Forsyth, the great congregational preacher? He once said this. He said, our churches are full of the nicest, kindest people who have never known the despair of guilt or the breathless wonder of forgiveness. And this may be a reason why we don't love him as much as we do, because our love will vary in direct proportion to how much we've been forgiven. And it may be that some of us have never been at the point where we see how much we need forgiving. I'll tell you this, those who have been forgiven much love much. And these people, we've murdered the Son of God, and God is ready to forgive? He's ready to blot it out as if it had never been? One of the loveliest things I think about God is that he has a power to do something that I haven't the power to do, the power to forget. Now you may think, what on earth is he saying? Because you know perfectly well I forgot your name last time I met you. Oh, I mean this, the power to forget the wrong things you've done. I haven't that power, but God has. I will remember some of the things I've done to God and to other people till my dying day as Paul remembered that he persecuted the church. You will remember certain things that you've done till your dying day and they may come back after 20 years and you thought you'd forgotten them and there they are. You'll, you'll remember them. And people have said to me, Pastor, I can't forgive myself for doing this. The answer is, of course you can't. You never will. You can't forgive yourself and you can't forget. But it says in the scripture that God says, when you are forgiven, I will remember your sins no more. 
And it means that one day when I meet God, I'll say, God, I, I really am sorry for doing that. And God will say, doing what? But Lord, you remember when I did so and so and God will say, I don't remember. I don't remember. To think that God is a God who can forget and that's what forgiving really is. I can't forgive myself. I can't forgive you. You can't forgive me. But God can forgive and forget. Now that deals with my past when I'm forgiven, but I've still got a future. What about my future when I'm going to do these things again? The answer is there's another gift. The gift of forgiveness for my past is matched with another gift for the future. The gift of the Holy Spirit himself. That deals with my future. Isn't God wonderful to think of everything? I constantly find myself amazed that I still haven't found any need that God hasn't thought about and provided for. Always thinks of everything. And so he says, your past forgiveness, your future the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter says this to the crowd. Remember there is no limit to the promise of the Holy Ghost. Either in time or space. The promise is to you and to your descendants and to those who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to him, which, thank God, means me. If I believed that Pentecost was over, I should be miserable. If I believed that the Holy Spirit couldn't be given today, I would wonder what on earth we could do if we could just have forgiveness but not the power. What could we do about the Christian life if we could only have our past dealt with but the future remains still in, in the grip of our weakness? What could we do? But thank God the promise is still to us. And Peter went on counseling them with many words and he said, remember this. If you're going to be saved, you'll have to step right out of this generation. This generation in which you live, the people around you, they're crooked. They think crooked. They behave in a crooked way. They're not straight. They're not upright. They have a crooked thinking about God. They have a crooked thinking about Jesus. They have a crooked thinking about right and wrong. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. I heard a critic of the Christian faith say this recently. He said, I think it's all wrong that Christians should get the idea that they're to save themselves or that anybody should be given that idea. It's selfish. And he said, this is what Christians are. There are a lot of people who are saving themselves. And you go to church and you see a lot of people just trying to save themselves. My first question would be, what's wrong with saving yourself? Now that may sound extraordinary, but there's nothing wrong with it or Peter would never have told them to do it. It only becomes wrong if after saving yourself, you don't seek to save others. That's the only thing that can make it wrong. If I was drowning in the sea, and a man in a boat was trying to save people, and he threw me a lifeline and said, grab this quick, I wouldn't say, now look, look here, this is not really a good motive for grabbing this. There may be others much more deserving than I. I would be foolish. I would grab it since he was a man who had been helping to save me. But if when I got into his boat, I said, now come on, let's get to the shore quick, while there are others in the water, then that would be wrong. I am then in a position to double those who are throwing out the life belt. That's what would make it right. There is nothing morally wrong in a preacher saying, save yourselves, indeed, that's your first concern. You must render your account to God. He will deal with you as an individual. Save yourself from this crooked generation. But then seek to save others. That's what makes it all right. And Peter told them quite definitely that because they were being saved, they'd find themselves straight in a crooked world. They would be different, social misfits. And everybody needs to be told if you get saved, you're going to find it difficult living in a crooked generation. But save yourselves rather than go down with the ship. Now we come to the third and last section more briefly. Five verses at the end speak about the expression of this faith. The fellowship of the saints. 3,000 converted and only 120 Christians to deal with them. I don't know of any situation like that. I've never seen it. One Christian to counsel 25 inquirers and to help them. 
Can you imagine that? It would be wonderful if we each had one during 12 months. Do you know that if each Christian in England won one other for Christ in 12 months and those two won two more in the next 12 months, in five years England would be entirely Christian? Which is the measure of our failure. It is at the moment taking 33 Christians 12 months to win one person for Christ. That's the figure at the moment. And here are 120 winning 3,000. Look at five things they did and five things they were. A potted account of church membership as it, as it ought to be. The five things they did, baptism for everybody as they came into the Christian faith and into the church. This was the way in. This was the normal, the natural, the right thing to do. Second, the next thing they needed was food to grow. They needed teaching and the apostles taught them. We don't have the apostles but we've got their writings and so today Bible study is a must for a new convert. Thirdly, they had fellowship sharing. Now this is a lovely word. It's something so much deeper than friendship. I remember at my induction I made a remark in St. Saviour's Hall which a lot of you missed so let me repeat it. I went to a chapel tea once and sat crowded up with a group of ministers at a table on the crack between two forms, you know the kind of tea, and plates one inch from each other and uh, the sandwiches in front and I took a sandwich, took a bite out of it and put it down and turned to my neighbour and started chatting as ministers do and uh, then reached for my sandwich and picked it up but it was much smaller. <laughs> So I took a bite and put it down and turned to my neighbor and when I put my hand out the next time it closed over someone else's hand and the minister next to me was helping himself and talking. That is fellowship in the New Testament sense of the word. In Greek language if you sit down at the same table and each eat your own sandwich that is friendship. But if together you eat the same sandwich, that is fellowship. That's what the word means. It means not just to do things together, but to share the same thing. And they continued in fellowship, and Christian fellowship shares the deepest things, the same things together. Fourthly, the breaking of bread. That means more than we're going to do in a moment. It meant having a meal together. It meant sitting down around the meal table and eating as a family and then at the end of the meal they would take the cup and the wine. And fifthly they continued in the prayers. Not just prayer but the prayers. And the prayers would be the Jewish prayers of the synagogue and the temple. Prayers they had recited for years and never understood the meaning of them. Prayers that had been just words, parrot fashion. Now they were real. And read prayers, set prayers, become living and real after the Holy Ghost has come. I remember the day I found out who Santa Claus was. I had always written to him once a year. Dear Father Christmas, or whatever I called him, um, we've left some ginger wine and nuts for you. We hope that you will reciprocate. Well, no, we wouldn't use that word then, but uh, we use words to that effect. And you know, every morning... Christmas morning there were bags for the three children and there were letters always in capital letters not in handwriting for some reason but there were letters and we kept up this sort of distant impersonal relationship but one Christmas Eve I was determined to see him come and I remember sitting at the top of the stairs in pajamas and looking through the banister rail and watching do you think I was disappointed no I was thrilled and I remember thinking, now I can talk to Father Christmas every day of the year. Now it's real. The letters are going to mean something. So I wasn't disappointed. And in the same way a man can go to church for years and have all the prayers out of the book. He can sing the hymns out of the book. And these are dead words, parrot fashion. And then one day, one day, he comes to know God and the Spirit enables him to sing the same words, to go through the same prayers, and they're alive and real. They continued in the prayers. Finally what they were. Five adjectives about this church. 
They were a reverent church. Fear was upon them all. Why? Because supernatural things happened in this church. Signs and wonders and mighty works were done. And when that happens, people are afraid. Rightly so. God is in this place. This is an awful place. It is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. And they were a reverent church. They feared God. They were a sharing church. They even shared their money and their cash. It was not communism because it was voluntary. As the communist speaker in Hyde Park is reported to have said, when we're in power, you'll all have a car, a house, and smoke cigars. And a man said, but I don't like smoking cigars. And the communist said, when we're in power, you'll smoke cigars and like it. <laughs> now that's communism. That is an imposed pattern. This is nothing to do with communism. This is people quite freely selling their property because some Christians are in need and money must be given. That's real community. It's not communism. It's friendship. It's sharing. They were a consistent church. Do you notice that they were just as happy in the temple and in their homes at their meals? And they praised God in both. There was no hypocrisy here. It was a sincere church. They were just as sincere praising God before they had the food as when they were in the temple. Life was all of a piece. They were a happy church with glad and generous hearts. They were a happy church and therefore the last verse tells us. They were a church that grew every single day. If we continue in baptism in teaching, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, in the prayers. If we are a reverent church with the fear of the Lord in our hearts, a sharing church that cares in the name of the Lord, if we are a happy church, if we are a consistent church in which we're just as Christian at home as we are here, then I believe that we shall be a growing church. And you notice this. It was the Lord who grew it. I can't make a church any bigger. You can't make a church any bigger. The Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved. I know of no other way to join the church except to get saved. Oh, you might get your name on the church roll if you fiddled it a bit. You might become a regular attender. There's only one way to get into the church. It's to be saved. And the Lord added to the church every single day those that are being saved. Now may I say that the church has gone on doing that for 2,000 years. There has not been a single day for 2,000 years when the Lord has not added to his church. Every minute I speak there are 15 more Christians in the world than there were a minute ago. And the Lord added daily those that were being saved. Well, Pentecost was the longest day. I hope this will be the longest sermon in this series. But what a day. Let us pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will add someone to your church now. We pray that somebody may be saved now. We ask that somebody in this congregation who does not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior may accept him now. We ask that he who lived and who went about doing good and performing great miracles, that he who died on the cross at the hands of lawless men, and yet according to your plan, that he whom you raised from the dead is proof that he was your son, that he who is even now at your right hand praying for us, that he will speak to someone now. We ask that you will tell them what to do about it. Tell them what to say to him. We ask that you'll go on building your church every day. For we ask it in his name. Amen.